This is a joint work with my colleague Abilio Rodriguez, who is there somewhere. Where's Abilio? Yeah, he's there. And any questions you can ask him? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for thinking about my talk. And what I'm going to speak now is a kind of a very naturally, very interestingly, a kind of a continuation of what Stan Reed just said, in the sense that we are going to be a kind of a little magic little logic magic, which is going to guarantee the analyticity of some rules which you avoid uh, some paradoxes into the theory of truth. I, first of all, I would like to uh, have your permission to give uh, good news. The good news is, if, I, if you permit me, to tell you that we just encountered the ballots and the election for rector that we just are running here for the last two days, uh, the group we subscribe to, the group we support has won, and we hope that now we are going to have uh, new rectors in the university, less committed to capital, to medical companies, and more committed to education and research. So it's a good news for us. I think it's good news for you. Money, there is a lot of money. The problem is that this university, I'm not going to make it political statements, how to spend it, do well in that money that there is. Okay, so. So Italo was there until morning, until four o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, so she has more to tell. Yeah, she was one of our uh, guarantee that the election was, was right, the counting of the ballots was correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I cannot, I cannot reply to that. Uh, so our idea here is to uh, sort of show how, using a little logic magic, but very acceptable, I hope, to convince you, we can impeach some paradox to enter into the theory of truth, not only the liar paradox, but also the curry paradox, which is um, very hard to impeach because, you know, as you know, the curry paradox is a kind of positive paradox. And though has, in principle, nothing to do with negation. So any attempt to, 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 to use a weak negation, like a consistent negation, uh, is going to fail. It's, perhaps it's, it, can, it can impeach the liar paradox. But it's going to be uh, innocuous in impeaching uh, the carriage paradox. Well, basically, I sometimes you know sometimes I make some slides and I I don't want to to, to say what I wrote in those slides. I like to explain it, which may be good. Sometimes it's not. I I will try this time, yeah, just to take in a kind of hook, you know, which is Stefan Red said. Uh, coming back to Tarski, so Tarski says that the liar paradox is true and its negation is true. Do you? Oh, oh, okay. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Tarski says, with respect to the T schema, that the, uh, the liar is true and its negation is true, so it's inconsistent. Okay. We tend to agree to Tarski, one with a little distinction. We would say it's not uh, uh, inconsistent, it's just contradictory. There should be, we believe, a distinction between inconsistency and contradiction. If you accept that view, what I'm going to tell you makes full sense. If you don't accept that, everything I'll say makes no sense for you. Okay? So, we believe that Tarski was correct just by changing a little bit the it's, word. It's, 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 it's just contradictory, not inconsistent. So, it's contradictory and consistent in a sense. Because it consists of something. That's the, the basic idea behind what I said. The difference is, is a big one. Like, a, well, when you, are, you, you, you have some contradictory statements, that refer to something very solid, then you cannot stand it, you cannot have it. But if I say that it's, it's, it's warm today, uh, Rodolfo said, well, it's not that warm, so 
this concept is not solid enough for, to permit to, we, to, to get to any conclusion. But if I say, my bank account has one million reais, and at the same time it has two million reais, then something is wrong. Because money is a very solid concept, very consistent concept. You know? If you accept that, that makes good sense what I'm going to say. Okay, this uh, Tarski uh, goal in the concept of truth was to construct uh, with a certain language and certain characteristics a materially adequate and formally correct definition of the predicate is a true sentence, as everyone knows. And such a definition, okay, would be possible to be used in, you know, in a coherent way in, in deductive sciences, uh, avoiding semantic paradoxes. So, the, uh, and he would say that the definition is materially adequate if and only if it grasps the meaning of the expression X is a true sentence, X is a true sentence, as currently implied, and it, it holds just for true sentence of given language, so the T schema, see S is true if and only if S, would do the job. Uh, but. Also, we have to be careful to which logic we have, because if not, we have a problem. The liar paradox, as you know, I can derive it. Just, I, I'm not going to repeat this here, but it's true, and at the same time, it's not true. Stephen Webb just, just said about that, just uh, mentioned this. But this contradiction, this contradiction is due to the following assumption. The language is semantically, semantically closed, contains names of your own expressions. And in which sense, Stefan just explained, in which sense a language it can be understood to be uh, to be uh, object of uh, attributed uh, semantical meaning. Uh, the usual logical rules hold, uh, the T schema also holds. The conclusion is that the consistent use of the truth predicate in harmony with laws of logic is not possible for a natural language since it is semantically closed. Theory of truth for a language L yeah, must be built in a meta-language. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, what we have here is a little theory we call Venom that we want to apply in order to maintain many, many aspects of theory of truth and to be very, and this theory is going to be very careful as not be able to uh, derive uh, the usual paradox. Let's see how it works. So, Vero is an extension of a lot, let's take it's an extension of a Robson arithmetic Q. Could be also an extension of a piano arithmetic, but just make it simple to, as an example. Uh, by means of the arithmetization of its syntax, we can talk about its very sentence because Q is, is powerful enough for that. So, VR, or Vero, as, uh, has a semantically closed language, okay, by means of the usual uh, arithmetization tricks. Now, the diagonal lemma holds for it, because since Vero is an extension of Q, represents every recursive function. So if the A of X is a predicate of a language, which just X free, then there is a sentence D, such that in VR, I derive D if and only if a apply to the given number of D. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's strong enough to have this lemma here. So D is the given number. Now we are going to omit the single. Now, D is equivalent to a, a sentence that says the following. D has the property A. Okay. So here the problems start. So the liar paradox. If you take uh, the formula not true of X as a predicate, X is not true. It can pr be proved that there's a sentence lambda, because of the diagonalization lemma, such that lambda says, uh, says a lambda if and only if not true of lambda. Okay? So lambda is equivalent, equivalent to the liar sentence. Uh, and since the T schema holds, you have also lambda if and only if T of lambda. So we have from one and two, we get a contradiction in the actually in three steps, two or three steps, right? Because lambda is simultaneously equivalent to true of lambda and to not negate of, true of, of, of uh, not true lambda. Okay. So if your logic is classical, we get triviality. Now, a simple solution 
as we already ourselves had thought before, it would have been a phony. Okay, just take uh, this negation as a paraconsistent negation. <clears throat> In which sense a paraconsistent negation would solve this problem? Well, <clears throat> because a paraconsistent negation is a sort of weakening, weak, a little bit weaker negation, but not too much weak. It's weak enough to permit you to reason under contradictory statements, but strong enough to permit you to recover classical logic, if you want. So as an example was just given to Marco some months ago, everything works like that. Uh, if I divide the world into consistent statements, some not consistent statements, from the non-consistent statement, like it's warm today, or anything like that, if I get a contradictory under this scenario, I'm going to make myself to refrain from deriving everything. So I refrain from explosion. But if the scenario would be talking about the hard or consistent, while we start listening to concepts like money or uh, something that can be measured very well, things that we agree, that's not the role of logic to divide this world into two statements. We have to agree on that. So if uh, for, for hard or for solid statements, consistent statements, then we use the classical logic. So how can I recover classical logic in this scenario? Just by assuming that everything I'm talking about is solid and consistent. Okay? So paraconsistent logic in this sense is a very nice like, approximation of classical logic because it's a little bit weak, but not that much. Not losing anything. I'm just generalizing my, my point of view. Okay, but unfortunately, paraconsistent logic does not solve this problem. Why? Because you have Carey's paradox as well. If I avoid this paradox, I get a new one. Carey's paradox is positive. So, this came up with a diagonal lemma and theological researchers to analyze the theory even without the principle of explosion. So it's completely independent of the principle of explosion on which paraconsistent logic is based upon. So I'll consider the predicate T of X implies P. P is any sentence you like. I mean, in, in five steps, you get the following. Uh, C, if and only if, then C implies P. By the diagonal lemma, apply it to this uh, predicate here. Then by T schema, C, C if and only if, T of C, from one of two, you get C if and only if, C implies P. C implies P is a kind of positive negation. You can regard it like that. It kind of, you don't need it to, I, I like to see this way, you don't need to do this. It's the proof is completely the same if you like this uh, interpretation or not. But anyway, C is equivalent to C implies P, and from positive sentence logic, and modus ponens, we get P, where P is any sentence you want. So, trivialization of the logic without any use of negation or explosion or anything like that. Okay. Of course, there are many solutions to this problem. Relevantists would say this uh, some steps is not valid. Uh, this absorption rule C implies C implies P is equivalent to C implies P is not valid. Uh, there are many ways of uh, uh, ad hoc ways of um, avoiding the C, but I think that they are really ad hoc in the sense of um, uh, impeaching some rule on purpose. I mean, our solution is going to be a bit more general, I, 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 I hope to convince you. Now, this proof makes use of modus ponens definition of uh, if and only if. I mean, the language must have a rules for conjunction and implication, deduction theorem, and the thinning rule. This uh, weakening of well, or reflexivity, if you like. Uh, okay, so this theory is, is proved uh, trivial only by research of propositional logic plus this diagonal lemma and etc. Uh, implication and uh, conjunction is primitive. The fact is, restricting this principle of explosion to a paraconsistent principle is not enough to avoid triviality. Okay? With the T schema and a few logical uh, researches, 
even without negation, we get trivial from using this uh, Curry's uh, argument. Okay, now back to uh, some attempts to rescue the theory of truths from this trouble. We find a paper by, by Pfefferman, which says, well, he, he makes a very nice attempt to rescue the theory, very complicated but solid. And in a certain point, he said the following There are three possible routes that may be taken in the face of your paradoxes. Namely, by restriction of language, logic, or basic principles. Okay? Two way. And he chooses a certain, certain way to do it. We are going to show that's possible, uh, very rationally possible, to choose another path. Restricting language, that is, projecting semantically closed language, is the route to taken by hierarchical theories of truth, like the Tarski, which asks for the meta language and the meta logic into the, the scenario. Pfefferman restricts the T schema and bases his system in classical logic. But he mentions, well, this solution is going to be very complicated because of that, but at a certain point he mentions the following. There is a nice alternative in the sense of adopting a paraconsistent logic, but he remarks the following. So far as I know, it has not been determined whether such logics, consistent logics, account for sustained ordinary reasoning. Not only in everyday discourse, but also in mathematics and the sciences. If they do, they deserve a serious consideration as possible root under two. But he makes a very basic and simple mistake. He maintains some doubts about paraconsistent reasoning in accounting for sustaining ordinary reasoning because he's thinking on dialectism. He's thinking on dialectic logic. It's very hard to be convinced that dialectic logic accounts for a sustained ordinary reasoning. And I just wrote to him and said, look, Solomon, if I may, there's another approach you're not taking into consideration. There is another way of um, uh, working with paraconsistent logic which has no thing to do with dialectia. This and this and this and this and this, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, very good. So I, I don't have time to do that. You, you are strong and brave enough, go and do it. Good, thank you. So that's what, well, uh, that's what we're doing. So for me, he's suggested of using another paraconsistent logic, not dialectic logic, and see how it works. Now, what we are going to do here is sort of a rethinking logic. We are going to take the root number two. And we are not going to change anything. There's the logic a little bit behind it. Instead of restricting language and without constraining the T schema, we adopt the paraconsistent logic as underlying, well, kind of, actually, is a generalization. It's a more, still more general form of paraconsistent logic. I'll show you in a moment how it works. As the underlying logic of our Verum theory, preserving classical logic as the underlying logic of arithmetic. So, again, arithmetic is, is strong enough for we to apply classical logic to it. The idea of truth is not that solid, in a sense. It's more fluid. Right? It's more more abstract in a sense. So arithmetic will be there by maintaining classical logic. Uh, okay, but underlying logic, well, let's go to the important points. The underlying logic of VR, VR of Verum, will be a logic, as you call it, of formal plenitude. Well, a uh, kind of a generalization of basic idea of logical formal inconsistent. How is this? How is it that? The, the idea is the following. Logic of uh, Formal plenitude are I right here. No, well, I think it's the next slide is, is there is what I need. So logic of formal inconsistent are theories about the logical consequence that tell us how to reason in the presence of contradiction. Uh, this I don't know what's coming in my next slide, so I write here what I need.
That's all we need to work with this logic of the formal inconsistent. All other logical principles can be maintained. You just need that to be more careful about the law of explosion. From alpha, not alpha, we do not entail any beta I want. So this, I just delete this rule, but I have the following rule. I do derive anything from a contradiction if I'm in a consistent scenario. Okay? If I'm talking about consistent things, consistent uh, objects or whatever, then from a contradiction and plus an assumption of consistency, I'll get everything. So, Everything we do, my, in my research group with João Marcos, Marcelo, and other students, Itala has done a little bit of that, but in another direction, uh, we uh, try to build a logic using this. Of course, this is just one step, but the, the, the real problem is how to build your logic with proof theory, acceptable semantics, etc., etc., how to confer uh, uh, logic citizenship to this idea. But this is what we have been done here in the last, last year. Now, consistent alpha. Ah, this is an arrow. Oh, this here. Ah, the ball. Yeah, this is the, exactly. This, the symbol means consistent. Eh? Ah, no, OK. It's not predicate. It's a kind of a, uh, operator. It's a new, new kind of. You can you see it as a unary connective. You right. You can. Right. Yeah. Sorry. I, 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 yeah. That's for for clarification. So it will be working as a kind of a new uh, unary connective, introducing as a primitive. Well, there is. We have written several papers where I try to convince people that there is no principal reason why not to think about a new uh, unary uh, connective uh, different than negation, for instance. Why not? So if negation can be taken as primitive, why not consistency? Why? Why consistent could not be taken as, as much as primitive as negation is? Or as derivable in certain other contexts? In principle, there is no reason why not. The only test is Build a logic using it. If you can do, congratulations. Okay. Now, the logic of a formal planetary is a kind of a generalization of this idea. Uh, not only thinking about anything primitive uh, concerning negation, but also. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I will just uh, skip this slide because everything I had said is in blackboard. Now, uh, now the logic of a formal plenitude will be working. Just looking at what's written in blue here. I think it's more informative than anything else. <coughs> Logic is of a formal plenitude will be the following. I mean, I'm going to use a new symbol to control not explosion now, but to control the power of uh, mole exponent. So from now, I take the following, <coughs> the following uh, uh, hypothesis or following working hypothesis. From A, and A implies B, I do not immediately derive B unless I have, I'm granted that A has some, is, is full with respect to implication. What means, what it mean, does it mean to be full with respect to implication? I do not know. It's something primitive. I mean, this star A means A is something applied where, where, where it's, it's in a context where uh, the deduction theorem can be applied. Okay, it's just, it's just, this is what, what is a context wh where A and A implies B can be applied? I don't know. A context where implication is true. Implication can be defective. And then I cannot apply this rule. In some other contexts, it is 
not defective. It's true. How, how can logic decide which contexts are defective, which contexts are not defective, with respect to implication? Logic cannot. That's a matter of philosophical reflection. So, does not blame logic for it. Just take as granted that there is this possibility. If you if you do this, then this 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 uh, star symbol can be read as a kind of a consistent operator, I mean, kind of a generalization of this guy here, in the sense that <clears throat> star A means the truth value of A has been conclus conclusively established, that is, A is definitely the case, or is not the case, but not both. In this sense, it's full with respect to, to implication. Uh, this reading seems to be a very intuitive way of understanding the constraints of both logical formal inconsistent and informal plenitude. So in this sense, this very new kind of concept called logical formal plenitude are going to be a generalization of the previous idea of a formal consistent or formal inconsistent. Uh, with respect to model spawning, the restriction may be understood as follows. From a premise that for some reasons we are not completely sure, we just do not draw conclusions from. Just refrain. Okay, now. Uh, so, in reply to Pfefferman, we think that LFIs, the logic of formal inconsistency, and LFP, the logic of formal plenitude, gave a very simple and natural account of the human reason in general, including formal and empirical sciences. Why do we say that? Of course, we use some pages to convince everyone. But the idea is just as simple as that. You divide the context. You, you are you are responsible for supposing, for assuming, to which things I can apply modus ponies and uh, explosion to which context I cannot do it. If you just agree that there may be a distinction, you don't lose anything. Everything you did before using classical logic, you can do. If you decide to do relevant logic under this, this view, you can do it. If you decide to do uh, intuitionistic logic, you can do it. So this has no metaphysical commitment at all. No dialectics are present. The word does not need to be contradictory. There, I don't need to find a round and square tower. Okay. Now, back to the theory of truth. Now, beside the truth predicate, an unrestricted version of T schema, supposing Q is consistent, that's, I mean, very acceptable. If Q is not consistent, everything is destroyed, even the arithmetic. We have to cue the following principle. If I derive A in Q, then I derive in our value theory A and A is full. So everything in Q arithmetic is full. Which means that A is proven in Q, then A holds in value, and A is implication full. Okay? Now we substitute the model spawning by the following rule. A, A implies B, and A is full, then I derive B in my VR Veron theory. Now, we are restricting, but not much. So this restriction is illogic, but it's done in such a way that the underlying logic of arithmetic remains classical. So one effect of CA, this principle I just said, and this uh, modified model spawning, is that for all theorems of Q, I still derive that uh, for if A is a theorem of, of Q, I derive that A is true. It's a derivation in five steps, very simply. So everything in arithmetic, which is supposed to be consistent, will be derived from here in our theory. Well, it's a good extension of arithmetical thinking. Uh, Moreover, some other features of this value theory, uh, if you take the truth predicate in a, in a transcendental sense, and it's something that refers to a notion, a notion of truth outside Q, for instance, the Gero sentence, I mean, Gero, the Gero sentence, G is true, in which sense? 
we have here only the corresponding instance of the t schema. So g if and only if it tg for a given sentence, for instance. So vr proves the truth of proposition only if it's proven in q. Now, vr does not prove g. It does not prove not g. And of course, does not prove tg by itself, although g is true outside vr. So it only says that tg if and only if g. So it's, it's in line with uh, Peter's first incomplete theory. We're not getting anything crazy here. So it's not only uh, is in line with the Peter's theory, but also is materially adequate in the sense that it derives the T schema for every sentence in its language, including lambda and C, the liar the curry, curry paradox. So it proves T lambda if and no if lambda for the liar paradox. The proof is T of C, if and only if, if, and only if C, for curry paradox. But since such sentences do, do, they do not belong to Q, there is no truth predicate in Q, I do not get lambda and lambda is foo. And I don't get carry and carry is foo. Which means the following. There is no formula of the language that, uh, of course, because there's no, uh, in, in, such that A and the star A, uh, so, prima facie, what I have here is that this Venn theory avoids liar and curry paradox. At least it avoids this derivation, the simple derivation, the usual derivation we know. Okay. Actually, you cannot even prove the diagonal limb in VR with respect to the negation of this. Yeah. what? T? True spread T. True spread T. Okay. So, what we have here is funny. We do not obtain the usual derivations of you. Um, trivial, trivialization of the system by uh, using either liar paradox, neither curry paradox. But of course, we, 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 don't, we don't know if there is another way. You know, obviously, we could never be able to prove that the theory of the truth is consistent. Ten minutes? Oh, I'm just kidding. Uh, so of course we don't we don't have any uh, final proof of consistency of our theory because it involves arithmetic. Now, of course, any good arguments uh, object against that. But what we have is that the usual and simple-minded arguments are not going to be to be valid here. And we have lost anything, nothing. Everything is 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 there. I mean, uh, the truth in uh, schema, uh, even the laws of logic, because if I decide to impose the following condition, everything is full and everything is consistent in particular, then I am back to classical logic again. Then I derive the paradox again. That's the price you pay for supposing the world is so nice, it's so homogeneous. It's more pretty dinner, right? So, now regarding this T schema, at first sight, it seems that there are lots of reasons to be suspicious about the truth of the naive version of the T schema. But this is not a story. We're not entering into this discussion. You, we could. No saying will be uh, our, our logical constructions pose no restriction on uh, declaring the T schema to be suspicious or not. But I just am telling you that's a second discussion. However, instead of restricting it explicitly, we are just very careful in drawing conclusions from it. The solution we propose does not stress it is schema, just stress the logic a little bit. Just a little bit. I want to emphasize this point. Just a little bit at the point of making for you to decide if you want to take the restriction up. So there's no C nil. It's just in a sense a kind of a, uh, uh, 
warranty. We are we guarantee that the rules are being used in an analytically valid way, analytically acceptable way, axiomatically. We leave it an open possibility to be further investigated whether or not the results we get from the T schema within the first order theory are in a pair with the other strange results. Like, if, I mean, in completing the noise model, Scott and Paradox, I do, we do not know. We suspect there may be a connection here, but we had actually no, no time. This is brand new. This, uh, we have not even a paper to read. This is completely new ideas. I'm just presenting to you for the first time. Uh, such results would rather show that first order logic has limits, okay, I mean, in a somewhat Kantian sense, must not be surpassed as more or less as you said yesterday. That, uh, as I said, am I exaggerating if I say that we are facing with this that dilemma? Um, we have to stay with first order logic and face some problems with uh, uh, non standard models, etc. Or we are outside of it and have no, no, no salvation, in a sense. But this is a, a completely uh, secondary discussion for our purposes. Uh, uh. Well, the final remarks come before the two slides. Sub-final remarks. Sub-final remarks. There is still much to be done. That's the sub Much to be done. But let's go to the next slide. All known dialectism. That's an important point for us. This approach, although based on a part of consistent logic, is not committed with dialectic, the view according to which there are true contradictions, and we don't need it. It may be. Dialectism can, can be correct. There may be uh, contradictory sentences in the world. But of course, they need it, and we don't need it. That's this distinction. We suppose it could be true, we do not suppose it is true. So, dialectism is sort of equivalent view that reality is contradictory. Maybe. As we see, what sometimes makes it difficult to recognize the philosophical significance of paraconsistent logic, at least in the way we, we do it, is the wrong view that paraconsistent logic are necessarily committed to accepting contradictions of ontological character. At least in our view, we don't need any assumption like that. So, of course, here I don't need to, to clarify this, but for certain audiences, I have to even to clarify that contra uh, paraconsistent logic do not look, do not seek contradictions, do not derive the contradictions, it just supports contradictory in a rational way. Okay, anyway, my final remarks are in the wrong place, but they are final. No, they are correct. Thank you very much.